today. Uh, I, you know, discipleship is something that's talked about a lot in the church. Um, you know, there, there are sermons <laughs> preached on discipleship. There have been books that have been written about discipleship. Um, but it wasn't until years after I had been walking with the Lord, had gone to Bible college, that I, that I even realized what discipleship uh, was and, and in its most kind of impactful form, right? Because you can go to several different churches that have discipleship programs, and, and I'm all for that. Praise God for that. Uh, but it wasn't until I had moved to Mallorca, Spain, um, that my pastor had kind of uh, showed me, uh, without saying it, what discipleship really looked like. And um, it, it was literally just taking, with me, taking me with him to uh, eat lunch. It was uh, going to um, funerals and, and, and weddings and, and watching him interact and minister to to people. It was the opportunities that I was given. The first time I ever preached a sermon on a Sunday morning was at the Santa Monza Community Church in Mallorca, Spain. And, and, um, and still to this day, I owe so much of who I am as, as a man and who the Lord has, has made me to be uh, to, to my pastor. And so I'm, I'm, anytime he's in town and he tries to give me the whole, you, you just preach. I just want to come. No, he's going to be uh, preaching because I've been so blessed for so many years um, from receiving from him. And I just want you guys to be. Uh, equally blessed. So, uh, Raph, come bring it, bro. Good morning. It's, it's you know, I told uh, uh, um, Jimmy, keep it short with the intro because then you guys expect a cannon and you get a pellet gun. <laughs> but uh, it's, it's a real privilege to be here. And, and as Liz was praying about... Um, this, you know, kind of, I don't know, she sort of insinuated the, the, the things we've gone through in coming to church. Usually, I have my routine in Mallorca. You know, I, I wake up, and then um, I, I have a coffee, and I take off and go to church, and then Loretta comes with the kids later, and I have time to look at my notes. Well, this time, today, was just like, and, and by the way, going with my kids into the city is just crazy. Arden is a ball of fire. He's a force of nature. And, you know, you just hold his hand and he's just pulling you everywhere. So anyway, but, you know, I'm, it's a real privilege to be here, no matter what struggles we've gone through this morning. And, uh, and I hope that it will be a blessing to just uh, meditate on, on the greatest person that's ever lived. Just to uh, think on Jesus and the great person that he is, the great impact he has on our life, and, and the, the response of our lives uh, towards him. So let's turn in our Bibles to Philippians chapter 2, <clears throat> and we're going to look from, we're going to read from uh, verse 5 to verse 11. It said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and given him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven, and of those on earth, and of those under the earth. 
and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Father, I just pray that you would take this time and that you would speak to our hearts, Lord. I pray, Lord, that um, you would do the great miracle, Lord, that you always do to, to just speak to people right where we are at individually Lord and I pray that you would draw near and let your teaching fall on us like do on tender plants Lord in Jesus name amen in the early church uh, when Paul wrote this many believe that this is a hymn of the early church music and, and lyrics were used in order to educate people in in the, in the doctrines of the faith <coughs> So uh, they would put a song together with, with theological terms and then they would sing them and, and, and the people would, you know, what happens with music, you, you just sing it and sing it and next thing you know, uh, you're going through stuff and next thing you know, a song grabs your heart and you're humming it and then you're thinking of the lyrics and you're like, oh wow, I'm being ministered to. You know, music was used in order to educate uh, people in the, in the things of God and the doctrines of God. And here it is, uh, many people believe that this, these verses we just read uh, were a hymn that speak about his whole life, the whole life of Jesus, his pre-existence as God, his redeeming work, his obedience, and the honor that has been given him. And you know, I just want to, just in passing, I want to say, you know, theology is a big, should be a big thing in our life. To meditate, not, you know, we, we read the Bible, but then also uh, to, to know uh, thoughts and, and themes of the Bible, themes of, of, uh, that, that we can hold on to in the Bible for us. You know, sometimes we, we, we can be like this. We go through extremes. Some people become systematic theology freaks and they ignore the Bible. And other pe people are just like, I just read my Bible. And I, I don't like theology, but we really do need, theology is simply the Bible being put into themes and to be able to learn from it. Samuel Tzfemer, a missionary to the Muslims for 50 years, he wrote this. <clears throat> Paul's 13 epistles, if they had no other use or purpose, would at least condemn forever all shallow-minded and narrow-vision Christianity. Think of what those early Christians must have been to read and appreciate Ephesians and Romans on a hot Sunday morning, crowded in an upper room. Early Christianity did not follow cunningly devised fables. It did not minimize the facts of revelation to escape the mental difficulties. It did not linger in the shallows of deism, but plunged into the mis mysteries of the Trinity, the incarnation, the resurrection, the restoration of, the, of a universe, the solution to all its riddles by redemption. Oh, the depths of the riches. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> that, you know, just, just the, 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 like Newton said, in, in the scientific world, he said, when they asked him, how much knowledge do you think you have? And he says, you know, I feel like I've been a little child in the shore of the beach, while still the depths of knowledge were beneath me to be discovered. You know, we should be ever growing people, growing in the things of God, growing in the, in, in the knowledge and person of Jesus Christ. We should not ever feel that we've arrived you know um 30 something years ago it's a, no 20 20 something years ago i'm not that old i joined the u.s army and i and, and i was about to go to iraq and i was baptized as a mormon and you know i had been messing with it for a little while because my best friend was mormon and and i just remembered you know you get to jesus and that's it you know you meet him sort of like they, they tell you about them, and then you don't, never grow deeper. In Christianity, when I became a Christian, all of a sudden I realized, oh no, he's so much greater. And we will always be growing in the knowledge of who he is. And this is this hymn. This hymn is telling us about him, for us to think about it, for us to let that dwell in our hearts.
And notice in verse 6, it says, who being in the form of God, meaning in very nature, Jesus was God. What it means is, it's actually explained further in the verse where it says, he did not consider robbery to be equal with God. So to say he who being in the form of God, meaning Jesus is God. Not something that Jesus achieved. You know, I really had a hard time with Jesus being God. I don't know if you've ever had a hard time, but I really had a hard time with it. I'm like, how in the world can a man be God? But it doesn't mean that Jesus was born and became God. It is not something that he achieved, but rather something that he possessed. A natural reading would be, before Jesus was born, in the likeness of men, Jesus exis existed in the form of God and equal with God. Notice later in verse 6, it says, Who being in the very form of God, did not consider it to be robbery. Consider it robbery to be equal with God. Another, the ESV says, did not count equality with God as a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself. And notice that word robbery, depending what translation you have, or grasped. That word is a word in the Greek called harpagmos, and it is an obscure word. It is nowhere else in the New Testament. It is nowhere else. It is not found in the Septuagint, in the Greek translation of the Old Testament. And it is found very few times, actually, in Greek literature. And one scholar said this about him, and I, and I want you to really get this. He said this, in every instant which I have examined this idiomatic expression, it refers to something already present, meaning he's God, right? Already some, something already present, and at one's disposal. The question in such cases is not whether or not someone possesses something or whether or not one chooses to exploit something. So the scholar concludes that the best translation would be, he did not regard being equal with God as something to use for his own advantage. I repeat, the robbery it means that he was always God, but he didn't use his deity when he came to earth for his own advantage. Notice when he was being tempted by the devil, if you are the son of God, turn these stones into bread. Although, you know, would that be a temptation for you? I mean, if, 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 if the devil came to me and says, turn the stones into bread, use the force, Luke, you know, I mean, it's just like, there's no way, there's, it's not a temptation for me. It was a temptation for him. But him being God did not use that for his own advantage. He didn't come to earth for his own advantage. He came to earth for our advantage. He came to us to help out, help us out. So he did not regard being equal with God as something to use for his own advantage. The passage does not say he refused equality with God as a temptation or how Jesus achieved equality with God as a reward or how he let go of equality with God as a possession, but how he, how he used his privilege and his advantage. I mean, Jesus, when he walked on earth, I mean, he said stuff like this, I am from above. I am not of this world. If you do not believe that I am the Almighty, that I am, you will die in your sins. In John 1, 1, it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In John 17, 5, Jesus said, glorify me with the glory that I had before the world was. In John 14, 9, it says, He who has seen me has seen the Father. In Colossians 1, 15, He is the image of the invisible God. 
And in verse 16, for by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth. Yesterday I got to take the kids and I love, I love watching life through my children's eyes. You know, I mean, the, I would just fly to Virginia, but I mean, to be able to go to D.C. and show them the place and, um, and then to be able to uh, come here and show them the, the Natural Science Museum. Is that what it's called? Uh, nat of Natural Sciences. Well, yesterday I took Jonathan to the planetarium. My brother said, you've got to take him there. And there we were. And this big oval th movie theater. And they took us into um, dark space. You know, they, we, we watch the galaxies and we they took us into from if you were out in space in some other galaxy they brought us to the milky way and then you travel through the milky way and then you came to earth and then they said how if you were in anywhere in the in the in the universe it would look the same the the universe is expanding and they said some people believe the universe would be if 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 we were in that oval place the universe would be the size of the earth but some people believe that the universe is infinite, which to me makes more sense in some ways. You know, because where does something end? You know, it's like you, you keep going, and then what? There's something. And then you keep going, and there's something. And then you keep going, and there must be something. I mean, there can't, there must be something. No matter how far you go, no matter how far you go in one way or another way, there can't be nothing. I mean, in some, it doesn't make any sense to me anyway. And then Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the beginning and the end. All things are being sustained by the Logos, by the very Word of God. He's sustaining everything. And He came to earth without ceasing to sustain everything. Man, I tell you, sometimes I feel like I grasp so little. And this, these kind of thoughts as we think about who Jesus is and how he created the macro and how he created the micro should enlarge our hearts. When we think of who he is and his kindness and his mercy and the depths of his person and the depths of his sacrifice, it should enlarge our hearts. And as we look at this passage at how he who was God and didn't use his deity for his advantage, but he humbled himself and came to earth. This should enlarge our hearts. Jesus used his advantage for us, not just for himself. To save us from our trouble not just to keep himself out of trouble. Not just, I mean, and it's such a contrast, if you think about it, to world leaders. And when we see Jesus as unique as, as he is, and when we truly get a glimpse of him, we become like the Queen of Sheba. You know, you look at, you look at the world leaders, Saddam Hussein, Gaddafi, um, Kim Jong-un. You look at the China. You look at the United States as well, you know. And, and many times it's so ego-driven, lording over people. You know, I watched Braveheart years ago. And, and you know, and, and I remember Mel Gibson saying to the king's son, he said, your position was made for the people, not the people for your position. The lack of, 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 of servanthood attitude. Everything is just like using advantage for themselves. Communism. Look at communism in Cuba. God, God, you, know, it, you know, you get five years in Cuba if you kill a man. You get 30 years in prison if you kill a cow. You know why? Because it's luxury meat. And because you're rebelling against the government. But Gaddafi had billions of euros. He had his own little island that he would go to. And you see this corruption that goes. And yet Jesus is unique. He used his advantage for us, not for himself. And this should enlarge our heart. And what I mean by the Queen of Sheba is, remember she traveled from so far away 
they say about 1,500 uh, kilometers. She traveled with her entourage over there to, to Jerusalem. And it says that she came with many hard questions to Solomon. And then that Solomon answered all her question. And it says in 1 Kings 10.3, So Solomon answered all her questions. There was nothing so hard that the king couldn't explain. And when she saw the wisdom of Solomon, the house that he built, the food on his table, and on and on, there was no more spirit left in her. She was just overwhelmed. And Jesus, when he showed up, he says, I'll tell you one, one greater than Solomon stands before you. Jesus should leave us without spirit. He should leave us breathless as we get a glimpse of him. Man, if we're bored of Christianity, the problem is with us, not with him. Think of him coming down into the womb. And you know, you, you, we always learn something new, but he goes into the womb. Think about when he was born with no room in the inn. And you know the manger? You know, they're, they're, they're made, the mangers in Bethlehem, they were made of stone. And I just learned this this week, actually. I was, I was, it was on Facebook. Facebook can be good sometimes, you know. <laughs> but uh, but it, uh, on Facebook, they said that uh, the, the manger was made of stone. And when, remember the shepherds came to Jesus? And then you're just like, why shepherds looking at Jesus in a manger? Well, this explanation was incredible. I hope it's true, and I'm not telling you some baloney, but, <laughs> but, uh, but you know what? What they said is that when, when you know, remember, in Bethlehem, when they were raising sheep, they would raise sheep for the sacrifice, for the sacrifices in Jerusalem. And when there was one that was blameless, in order to protect it from becoming blameless, what they would do is they would put it in the stone manger to protect it. So when the shepherds are called to the inn and they go in and they see that little baby, the Lamb of God, in the stone manger. Think of him for 12 years or what is it? Uh, or, or those, I forgot how many years, but working as a carpenter. Think of him of having to flee to Egypt when he was a baby. Think of the woman at the well and, and, and what he did to his, her soul. Think of when he went to the graveyard and that man was possessed by legion. Think of how he was with Mary Magdalene. Think how humble, how, how humble he was. Did you guys see the video of the Pope this past week? <laughs> I mean, come on, you can't be hard on him. Huh? I mean, who would do something like that too? I mean, <laughs> but Jesus wouldn't. We would, and the Pope would, but you would never imagine. Who touched, I mean, he just said, who touched me? Your faith has made you well. He didn't say, what are you pulling? And stop them, you know what I mean? It's just like his humility when he was being pressed by everybody. When the disciples says, hey, tell him to go away. No, let's feed him. I want to ask you this. Well, actually, let's think of him being spat upon, beaten, crucified. Think about the fact that sin was put upon him. That, that he who knew no sin became sin for us. Think of when he went and preached captivity to those who had died before and said, hey, you're free. Corey Ten Boom says, there's no pit deep enough that God's not deeper still. But my question is, why does Paul tell him all this? Just so their hearts would get a warm, fuzzy feeling? Just so they would be intellectual brainiacs about who Jesus was? No. He was telling them that so they would actually imitate it. Let this mind be in you which was also 
in Christ Jesus. It's funny huh, how we can become worshipers of God. We can become admirers of God. We can become, um, you know, just representatives of God. We're like, we carry the message, but not the life. And, 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 and Paul says, I want you to have the same mind that Jesus had. And we all struggle with it. Huh? Yesterday, man, I got, I got annoyed. Here we are in a Christmas scene. We're in, not Times Square. Where was it? Where the Christmas tree is? Rockefeller, Rockefeller Center. That's where we were. And we were sitting down, you know, the little one finally fell asleep. So he's sleeping on my arms. And then, and then Jonathan was there. And we were where people came out of the ice skating ring. And so it was quite an empty thing. I'm taking a picture. And these two Germans, Nothing against Germany. <laughs> you know, I, I love Germany. But there's, there's this guy, big buff guy. He just begins to get a selfie with this girl. And, and I'm taking a picture of Jonathan, you know, just like there. And he, they just get right in front. And then he just begins to push Jonathan. You know, and so I pushed him away a little bit. And then I said, hey, the kid. Hey, the kid. And then um, he realized I was pushing him. And then he just completely ignored me. And as I'm talking to him, he just passes right by until in my great humility and kindness and like-mindedness to Jesus, I said, you're an idiot. <laughs> and then he turns to me and he says, well, he was getting in my face and he was twice, three times bigger than me. And then he says, an idiot's a bit of a strong word. And then I speak German, so I went off on him in German, you know, and, 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 um, so, anyway, <laughs> we fail. <laughs> we fail. But my question is, I don't care if we fail. The question is, are we growing? The question is, are we changing? Sometimes we fail and we get all discouraged. And I've been convicted ever since yesterday, you know. Loretta asked me, what did you say to him? I said, nothing. <laughs> But I've been convicted. It's like, let this mind be in you. How little. I mean, can you imagine if Jesus annihilated everyone that ignores him? I mean, he's just so humble. And we can even re sometimes forget we idealize the Bible sometimes. We're not, not that, I mean, there's, it's okay to idealize the Bible, but sometimes we idealize the early Christians. We just think if we were just in the early church, I remember me with the persecuted church. I'm just like, oh, the persecuted church, they're just such amazing people. They're just suffering for Jesus. And then you go and they're a mess. We idealize. We have Facebook and Instagram. And you look at my pictures on Instagram, you don't see the struggles I go to get that picture done. I mean, it is hard to not get a blurry picture with my little one because he's constant mo constantly moving. You know, and, and so you're, you're struggling with, but Facebook and Instagram can be so deceitful. And sometimes when we read the Bible, we can almost imagine that the early Christians were just this spe special category Christian. You know what? They struggled just like we did. But he writes, I mean, in chapter 4, he says, Eunice and Sintichi aren't getting along. I mean, here you have the Philippian church, a church that is growing, a church that's been planted by the Apostle Paul, but there are people in that church that are actually not getting along with one another. And Paul says very practically, you know what? Consider Jesus, theology. But let this mind be in you, which is, was in him, practical theology. If theology does, is, does, is not close to our life, it is meaningless. It is absolutely meaningless. Paul says, you're, you're being mistreated. Okay. People have mis, mistreated me. Well, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Remember in chapter 1, it says, some preach the gospel out of selfish ambition, that they would make me suffer more. And here the apostle Paul is in prison because of some people claiming to be Christians that are putting them into trouble. And Paul says, who cares? 
whether they do it for selfish ambitions or not, as long as Christ is preached, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Remember, Jesus said, when they said, hey, those guys are preaching. Hey, if they're, you know, uh, if they're for us, they can't be against us. I am unashamedly a person that sees life and seeks to see life through the eyes of Jesus Christ. He's the wisest that ever lived. You know, there's a story about Pastor Chuck, who he was on the radio with us, uh, with another Bible scholar, and they were talking about prophecy. And as they were talking about prophecy, um, the, the, they, they, they were talking about the book of Isaiah. And, and, I, and Pastor Chuck said, well, in Isaiah it says, and the scholar says, but everybody knows that there was two Isaiahs. And then Chuck says, but Jesus quoted from both parts of Isaiah. And he didn't say Isaiah 1 and Isaiah 2. He just said the prophet Isaiah. And then the guy says, Jesus didn't have the knowledge we have. To where the line got cut off, he went off the radio. And then Greg Laurie called um, Chuck and said, hey, you got cut off. And he says, I didn't get cut off. I hung up. And he said, why did you hang up? And he says, how do you argue with someone who thinks they're smarter than Jesus? Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So Paul's intention in bringing this amazing passage across is not simply for admiration and to enlarge our hearts, but rather for imitation as well. Next to our longing to be Christians and belong to Him should be a longing to be like Him. This should be, a, I love what was said about, you know, leaders and representatives in our job, in our community, wherever we're at. And we fail. But the question is, do we have that desire within us? And even that humility to be able to say, sorry. But look at the three things to imitate. Look at the three things to in imitate. One is look out for other people's interests, right? I, I, got, I brought for travel. This is not usually the Bible I read, but I brought it for travel because it was a different, different translation. It's the New Living Translation. It's, he says this, if there's any encouragement from belonging to Jesus, any comfort from His love, any fellowship together in the Spirit, are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one mind and purpose. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interest, but take an interest in, other, in others' things as well. So one of the things we can imitate of Jesus is to, when we look at life, when we look at the church, when we look at our community, is let's not just think of our own interests, but let's see what other people, other people's interests are. And, and supremely, let's think, because Paul says it later with Timothy, he says, for, for each seek their own, but he thinks about the things of Christ. Let's ask ourselves, what is In a, another person's situation, Christ's interest. Number two, humility. This is huge. Sometimes I, I was, we did devotions. We do devotions every Friday. We, do, we read through the Bible with, with the church. And, um, and there was this lady that's, I don't know if she's a Christian or not. It, it's just kind of. She's a life coach, very, very, very wealthy person. 
And, uh, and at one point she said, if I would have heard that word humility one more time, I would have screamed. And her problem was false humility. Her, not her problem. She, she had a problem with the word humility because she had a prejudice of what it meant. Humility is not to think too highly of yourself, but also not to think too lowly of, of yourself, to think rightly of yourself. How can I explain this? Okay, I can think lowly of myself. I never, I never read a book till I became a Christian. But I can think soberly of myself that God came and enabled me to serve in the gospel. So I don't have to think that I was like, I'm not capable of doing this. I'm not capable of doing that because, and that's a bit of a false humility, but to think soberly. But with, with humility, the other thing that we have to watch out for is a sense of entitlement. Have you ever noticed that sometimes people just have a sense of entitlement as if we owe them something? I tell my kids and I tell myself, no one owes you anything. Sometimes people come to church like, what, what can you do for me? Sometimes we just are never happy because we are just entitled. We feel entitled to certain things. Listen, Jesus sustains everything, provides everything, uh, created everything, and he humbled himself even to the death on the cross. When the disciples came back, and pride, pride is a real temptation in our life. When we think higher of ourselves than we should, should. Paul told the Corinthians, what do you have that you did not receive? Are you creative? Do you have a great brain? Do you have, are you able to understand great things? How do you have that if it's not from God? And when the disciples came back from Jesus, having sent them out, they came back and said, listen, even the demons listen to us. I mean, it's just like, look at what we can do. And Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning. And I would have been like, what are you talking about? What does that mean? And then he says this, do not rejoice in the great things that God is doing through you, but rejoice rather that your names are written in the book of life. You see, in gifting, we're all different, aren't we? Some stand out more than others. Although the ones that stand out might not be as valuable as the ones that don't stand out. But I tell you what, at the cross, we're all equal. If we just see each other as at the cross, and you know, I saw there's communion elements there. And, and it's broken in little pieces. And I've always said, you know, I don't really like it when it's broken in little pieces. Which is fine. It's fine that it's like that. No, no. And just to, and just to clarify, see how he listens? No. <laughs> but just to clarify, we do it the same way at our church in Santa Ponce. It's broken into pieces. But I always like the loaf. And I always, and you know, we're all kind of hygienic and we get the little nice cups because we don't want to get each other's germs. But I kind of like the one cup because sometimes we over-personalize communion. It's, me and Jesus. No, it's not you and Jesus. It's Jesus for all, and you partake of that one Jesus together. So when I receive forgiveness for me, I realize that the same forgiveness I receive, other people receive. Humility. And then lastly, contentment. In Psalm 106, 25, speaking of the children of Israel, it says, Then they despised the pleasant land. They did not believe His word, but complained in their tents. Oof, guys, this is crazy verse to me. You see, do you ever see Jesus dissatisfied? He's in the wilderness without food. There's no sense of dissatisfaction there. When, when, when Jesus said, I have food to eat, you know nothing of. You see Jesus walking through life, even at the cross, it is finished, 
satisfied. You never see them complaining. He's perfectly contented. He humbled himself even to the death on the cross. And in Psalm 106, it makes a contrast. And if you do, if you do a, if you do a contrast of Deuteronomy chapter 8, where it's where you know the command, a man does not live by bread alone, those commandments. You watch the children of Israel, and all they did was disobey that. And you look at Jesus and he obeyed that perfectly. But notice what the children of Israel did. They were led past the wilderness, I mean, sorry, out of Egypt, through the wilderness, into the promised land. It was lush with fruit. There was giants, yes, but they enjoyed the fruit. They conquered the land. And you know what they did? Complain. But you know what's interesting about the verse? They didn't complain publicly. Each one complained in their own tent. Isn't that interesting? Because the temptation is, and we have to watch. I have my home. If I'm not careful, our house can become a house of complaining. We would never dare to say that in front of everybody. But at home, it's like, can you believe that he did this and he did that and he did that? And can you believe that he said that? And that wasn't theologically correct, you know? And, then, and this is like, mom, I mean, I can become so... And then that eats up like a cancer. Sometimes contentment about where God has us. Sometimes we can just go from one place to another. I remember when I lived in London, I was somewhere else every week in my mind. Loretta was like, you're going to drive me crazy. But when you get to a place that you're like, you know what? I'm going to choose to be content, to be grateful. Because after all, you came from heaven. And Arden, my little one, has been singing that every day. You came from heaven to earth and didn't complain once. For us. And now lastly, how do we get there? Because this, you know, he uses his advantage not for just for himself, but for ours. He humbles himself. He made himself a servant. He humbled himself in his service. He made himself nothing. He never ceased to be God. Jesus continued to fill the heavens with his power and presence. And if he had ceased to be God, he could not have achieved what he achieved. His earthly work could not have uh, taken eternal dimensions, the eternal dimensions it took. But how do we do this? How? Because it can be very discouraging if I tell you all this and then you're just kind of like, oh my goodness. Well, notice this in verse where it says, do everything without complaining. Verse 14, it says, do everything without complaining and arguing so that no one can criticize you. Live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like a bright light. Sorry, I messed up. It's verse 12. Dear friends, you always followed my instructions when I was with you. And now that I'm away, it is even more important, work hard to show the results of your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear. Notice this, for God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases Him. So this is not a uh, do this and good luck. This is God saying to you and to me, this is what I'm actually doing in your life. I'm growing you to become more like Jesus. We work out what he's working in. We work out what he's working in.
And I want to encourage us, become people who meditate on Jesus. Become Jesus who, uh, people who are always a little bit surprised, overwhelmed, excited about different aspects of who He is. But always remember, as we enjoy Him, that He's working in us. He loves us too much to leave us like we are. And in a church like this right now, we need to have the mind of Christ. Because if we're not careful, selfish ambition, complaining, pride, all these things creep in if we don't keep Jesus at the forefront of our minds and in the center of our hearts. So let's pray. Father, we're so grateful, Lord. We're so